and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. And I'm Marin Johns. Marin Johns, the editor in chief of Queer 40. Welcome back to Gay USA. So good to have you here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Anne Northrup, for stepping aside for this one, one blessed opportunity. Well, this is, uh, you know, October 11th is National Coming Out Day. And this, uh, this is uh, LGBTQ History Month. And we're making history right now. Let's start with some of the headlines. What's happening this week? Uh, Vladimir Putin has threatened nuclear war again and condemned the West for Satanism and more for accepting transgender people. It's just very, very scary. But LGBTQ Ukrainians in war-torn Kharkiv staged pride marches throughout the city this week. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court has begun its new term and LGBTQ rights and other civil rights look like they might be on the chopping block. Also scary. Uh, but in Georgia, the U.S. Uh, Senate Republican candidate, Herschel Walker, the football player, was trashed by his gay son for his lies. Yeah, young people. And on that note, hundreds of students have walked out of Virginia high schools uh, because they're protesting Governor Youngkin's anti-trans policies in schools. A story we've been following for a long time, a black gay man who was assaulted by an anti-gay Hasidic community patrol unit in Brooklyn uh, won a $4.5 million judgment in court. And uh, moving internationally, Qatar's UN ambassador has been blocked from uh, human, their human rights post over some really nasty picketed tweets. The CDC says, uh, look, monkeypox is here to stay for a while, but the vaccinations are working. And we're going to discuss some of the, the, the buzz or, or lack thereof around Billy Eichner's all LGBTQ rom-com bros now in theaters. Well, how about that, Vladimir Putin? I mean, he really centered his insane speech. Put, put that picture up that he gave in Red Square um, uh, uh, against he, he spoke against the West threatened nuclear war, said we're into Satanism, and uh, used as an example our alleged embrace of transgender people who are persecuted over here as well, of course. And uh, as I say, then he threatened, you know, he threatened nuclear war on top of the thousands that he's already killed in the Ukraine, including many civilians. You saw so many children and, and, uh, and, and civilians being killed. Who's, this, who's the real Satanist here? Who's the real Satanist? And might I remind people, he actually has a, a long-range nuclear missile called Satan II. So um, it's all very, very Dr. Evil, murky uh, moral territory. I really think he's obviously just showboating. It's very low-hanging fruit in Russia to hate on the West. It's too easy. I know, but in this speech, I mean, to, you know, he says, uh, to all the citizens of Russia, do we want to have here in our country in Russia, instead of a mom and a dad, parent number one, parent number two, number three, uh, are they completely crazy already there? Do we really want perversions that lead to degradation and extinction to be imposed on children in our schools from the primary grades? You know, I mean, it's, distra it's a distraction uh, from, you know, the fact that his regime is crumbling, but wow, it is, it is frightening. It is frightening, but in his in his speech, it, that rhetoric reminds me of his very Orwellian that double speak where he he talked about the freedoms of the West as being reverse religion, um, which which is you know something that's a little bit mind bending to really think about it. But but uh, that's how he's selling it to the Russian people. Um, well, that, that, no, go ahead. Well, just just then, I would like to know how do they define human liberty? How, how does that? What does it look like to them? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like people of draft age fleeing the country so that they can still have liberty. Right. And then some of them are saying, we thought we lived in a free country. And then they were going to be sent to the front as cannon fodder for Putin's uh, horrible war. They don't want to kill Ukrainians. No. Anyway, well, but 
Back in speaking Europe. of Ukraine, speaking of Ukraine, something, you know, those people, I think one of the blessings of this year, we've all fallen in love a little bit with Ukraine. We had no idea that they were such a free and feisty and, and proud and brave people. Yes. Uh, so a, a bunch of LGBTQ activists in Ukraine, there they are in Kharkiv, which is one of those cities that's been recovered from Russian control, but uh, which is still being bombed every day. Um, they, there they are going through the subways. They went through the streets with rainbow flags. The person in the front has a sign that says Russia is a terrorist state and all these rainbows all over the place. Um, one of them said, Putin doesn't care. If all he has left to rule is Kharkiv, in Kharkiv is rubble. And we wanted to show we stand beside our fellow citizens to the end. We are fighting for their rights and our rights. And they march. So, you know, they're showing solidarity. They're not fleeing the city. They're staying there. They're making a stand. I mean, I can't imagine what that feels like when I, I know about Kharkiv. They listen, they listen to the sh sound of shelling. There's bombs going off not far away every single day. And when I think about getting out my rainbow flag or my colored wig or my rainbow anything, it's, you know, a beautiful sunny day. It's like going, going for, out for a great weekend to a pride march. It's a party for us in some ways. But these people, I tell you what, that is brave to, uh, to go out and do that. Right. Well, we got another uh, right wing, not anti LGBTQ to worry about, and that's in Brazil. Um, so they had their first round of elections in Brazil, and uh, Bolsonaro, the, the the Trumpian guy on the right, um, got forty three percent of the vote, and Lula da Silva, the former president, uh, got forty eight percent. So that means nobody got fifty percent. So there's going to be a runoff. Uh, Bolsonaro is running on opposition to abortion, transgender rights, Christian national, and he supports Christian nationalism, just like the Republican Party in this country. All right. Uh, so where shall we move on to? Some national news? Yes, I think so. There's a lot going on here as well. <laughs> well, uh, you, you know, the Republicans came out with their platform. Remember how they voted 17 times against the Affordable Care Act, the, the Obamacare? They're dropping it uh, from their platform right now. Oh, no, don't worry about that. You know, after all this show. But then there's the Supreme Court, which is which meets on the first Monday of October, which we just had uh, this week. And, uh, you know, uh, everything is in play, uh, including LGBTQ rights. You know, people are focusing on uh, on voting rights, on uh uh, on this idea that legislatures are going to take over federal elections with no review. These are the, some of the big issues. But then there's that case that they've taken up, which is um, a website designer in Colorado who has never been asked to design a website for a gay wedding. Or she, I don't even know if she does weddings at all. But she's brought a case that they're, look, they have taken. With, I don't know how she has standing. Nobody has complained and saying, I don't want to do gay weddings and I want the right not to do gay weddings. Mm. And of course, this is, this is bigger than that case because they're going after an old decision by Scalia, a good decision by Scalia, which said, look, if a law, civil rights law, whatever it is, is generally applicable, you can't use a religious excuse. She's using not religion, but an artistic excuse. Uh, I'm an artist and uh, I shouldn't have to work for them. Right. So that's what's up at the Supreme Court. Of course, you're not going to hear any of these decisions probably mostly until uh, next spring. But they'll be hearing these cases starting now with Katanji Brown Jackson on the court. I hope she can educate some of these people. Mm -hmm. But, but Andy, what, let me let me ask you this. With this fear that we have, I think a lot of us are living with this anxiety that there's going to be a kind of wholesale repeal of these laws, including marriage equality. Um, but but trying to connect this idea with, with the lack of enthusiasm for repealing the ACA, do you think we might be worrying too much that when Republicans think about the instability in the world, the, the number of natural disasters, for example, I mean, if we if we repeal that that health care, you know, people look at what people went through in Florida, in Fort Myers. Um, it, it does. It's illogical to want to re repeal some of these safety nets. And I, f I feel the same way with marriage equality, because uh, we'd have to undo all of all of that that economic prosperity. We'd have to go back to this this uh, state by state uh, tax ramifications. Does anybody want to do this? Do we really want to do any of the businesses and, and local governments want to go through all of this again? 
Well, I think that Republican politicians, are, and that includes, they're happy to let the Supreme Court do their dirty work so they don't have to do it themselves. But then they get bitten in the ass with like the anti-abortion decision, which is hurting them in the midterm elections. Because yes, the court finally said you can do it. These Republican legislatures, you know, passed draconian anti-abortion laws. And that's the only thing propping up the uh, Democrats right now. Mm. So anyway... Okay, some more national news. Uh, the American Library Association is now having to ask the FBI to investigate the unprecedented threats that they're getting, mostly over having LGBTQ books on their shelves. And these threats include disruption of programs, verbal threats of physical harm, bomb threats, temporary closures of libraries across the country. Um, there's this one blogger in Brooklyn who has 1.3 million Twitter followers who keeps saying this library in this place has got a gay book or a gay or a drag queen story hour or something. Go there and the Proud Boys go there with guns. It's out of control. They want the Justice Department and the FBI to step in. Do you know, do you know what this reminds me of? And, and tell me if you think this is an overreach. But I think people have to understand that if we take this idea to its extreme, we're going to end up in a situation like Kabul in Af Afghanistan, where girls and women are trying to take their uh, entrance exams for university and a male suicide bomber comes in there and blows the place up, killing, you know, 53 young women. Well, because that is the logic. Like the, that is the logic. You take it to its furthest extreme sure. and this is where you end up. That is the bottom. That is, I think, behind a lot of it. The advancement of women in society has upset a lot of uh, men who are used to having privilege, and they're rebelling against that. So they take it out, you know, they try to pick on the most vulnerable, transgender girls, you know, uh, drag queens, but they're after women. And of course, with the abortion decision, they're really after women. I mean, come on, what could be, you know, more anti-woman than that? It is. It is. A, and when you think about a library as being quite a, a harmless place, it's a place to learn. What what we're really talking about here is the stopping, you know, trying to stop people from getting information. It's where I could go in 1970, you know, as a high school student and get gay books, the ones that didn't trash us like the psychiatrist did in those days. But, you know, mm -hmm. some gay novels and pull them off the shelf and bring them home and re read them. And it was, you know, it was it was very exciting. All right. Uh, uh, we've got a bad trans story here. <laughs> the first out trans military officer in the United States, Jamie Lee Henry, a military doctor, is uh, stands acute, was arrested for offering Russian secrets <laughs> in, uh, uh, in collusion with her spouse, Anna Gabrielian, a Baltimore doctor. They face uh, eight counts of conspiracy, disclosing uh, health information, um, and uh, it, uh, wow, you know. Well, I, well, I had heard. I mean, going to Russia. In Jamie's defense, I had heard that it was uh, Anna who does speak Russian and who is a Russian sympathizer who had kind of gotten her spouse on board. Uh, so that's that is the the latest angle that I had heard. It wasn't really uh, Jamie. Okay. Who really, we'll see. Uh, pushing it. We'll see. Can we go to Georgia before we get to some other news? Yeah. This, this broke just as we were coming on uh, our taping. So, you know, everybody knows the Republican Senate candidate is the former star football player, Herschel Walker, a total numbskull. I mean, it's unbelievable that he's even in contention, but he's neck and neck with a very decent Senator Raphael Warnock, the Democrat there. Um, but this week it was exposed that he paid for an abortion for one of his mistresses, wrote the check, sent her get well cards when she was recovering. Now he's trying to deny it, but he has this conservative gay son who is kind of problematic in some ways, you know, and, and is, is very conservative, Not doesn't see himself that much as part of the community, but he let his daddy have it. I stayed silent as the atrocities committed against my mom were downplayed. I stayed silent when it came out that my father, Herschel Walker, had all these random kids across the country, none of whom he raised. And you know my favorite issue to talk about is father absence. Surprise, because it affected me. That's why I talk about it all the time, because it affected me. Family values people, he has four kids, four different women, wasn't in the house raising one of them. He was out having sex with other women. Do you care about family values? I was silent lie after lie after lie. The abortion card drops yesterday. It's literally his handwriting in the car. They say they have receipts, whatever. He gets on Twitter, he lies about it. Okay, I'm done. 
done. Everything has been a lie. And so for the right to say I'm being suspicious for saying, hey, I'm, I'm done with the lies. When you all have been calling me saying, is this true about your dad? Gosh, we're not going to win Georgia, this candidate all. That's been you. You have no idea what I've been through in my life. You have no idea what me and my mom have survived. We could have ended this on day one. We haven't. I haven't told any stories. I'm just saying, don't lie. Don't lie on my mom. Don't lie on me. Don't lie on the lives you've destroyed and act like you're some moral family man. Y'all should care about that, conservatives. And then for people on the left to act as though I'm responsible for all of the things that he has done. I've talked about Father Epps. I've talked all these issues because they've been close to me, because they matter to me, because I went through it. That's why I've talked about it. So when you say, well, talk about your dad, but I am. I'm saying this behavior is atrocious. Don't come for me. You don't have to like my father. You don't have to like me. You don't have to. I'm just saying I'm done with the lies. We were told at the beginning of this, he was going to get ahead of his past, hold himself accountable, all of these different things. And that would have been fine. Go ahead. He didn't do any of that. Everything's been a lie. Everything's been downplayed. Everything's been cutting corners. The whole thing. And who, who is, whose expense is that at? Me, my mom, as we're chased down by the media, uh, we're, we're terrorized, all these different things. Uh, uh, people are questioning my authenticity. I'm done. Don't lie. Don't put this on me. You, this is a candidate issue, not a me issue. I wouldn't have spoken out if there weren't all these lies every day. Whoa! <laughs> that's Christian Walker, two snaps up. Oh, uh, well, he, I mean, look, that's fantastic, but it does raise the question that certain people obviously don't care that it's all a lie. Well, it's been said that Republicans in Georgia would vote for Jeffrey Dahmer over a Democrat. Um, and, mm -hmm. But you have an exceedingly decent candidate and Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock. Uh, so, and uh, speaking of Georgia, uh, Marjorie Taylor and family values Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene finally announced she's getting a divorce from her husband. Uh, she was having two affairs back in 2012, but they stuck together for the sake of the children. I, and I'm not knocking any of that on a, on a personal level. I mean, I believe in divorce, um, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, she has a Democratic opponent named Marcus Flowers, 46, who has very little chance, but has raised $8 million, or $10 million, actually, uh, in this very deep red district. Not likely to win it, but likely to draw up enough Democratic votes that's going to help maybe Raphael Warner in the Senate mm -hmm. election and things. So there you are. Yes. And yes, then, the marriage is irretrievably broken, uh, according to the husband who filed. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, what about green sponsor, Donald Trump? He made some news this week. Oh, uh, well, is that because of Maggie um, Haberman's book coming out, Confidence Man? It sounds so interesting because I know, I mean, I can't, I, I think I wouldn't want to pick up and touch that book. Uh, but I do think as, a, as an author and as a journalist, she, she has some serious cred and she grew up in New York and she knows what she is dealing with. Uh, some of the details that are coming out about Trump's uh, historic uh homophobia and transphobia it's it's it would be funny if it wasn't so shockingly frightening and tragic um but it, it's so ingrained in him that uh uh, she she has definitely um, uh, described it so well, and I think that a number of news outlets have picked out little bits. Daily Beast uh, ran with a few um, uh, details about uh, you know Rince Priebus trying to uh, school uh, Donald Trump in how he should respond to a transgender person, and of course Trump failing miserably. Failing miserably, he when when Rince Priebus said he was like going to be a person in the audience who was transgender asking a question. And I'll just say it on the air here. Uh, Trump said, cocked or, or, or decocked? And Rance Priebus looks at him like, what the hell is going on? And he's, you know, apparently often refers to gay people as queers or faggots, um, but not to their faces, mm -hmm. you see. Um, he bragged that he paid gay employees less. Uh, it, you know, it, it goes on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, what I got out of this. Why would any gay voter vote for this guy? But I mean, we've brought that well, up. Well, if they would, and I understand that these decisions could sometimes be based on other things such as, you know, economic and financial. But what I would say is a word of warning to, to people who, who, uh, 
who do vote for Trump is, is, is one of the things that these examples are illustrating is his, his ability to other people so easily and quickly. And, and once you're able to other people, you're able to dehumanize them. And we all know what happens with leaders who are able to target and dehumanize segments of the population. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the problem. And uh, what about what happened, the revelations about women's soccer? I had not been following this beforehand, but there was a big uh, study done. They hired a law firm headed uh, by Sally Yates, who's the former deputy uh, attorney general of the United States, to look into this. And boy, they found a cesspool there. Yes, you can. I don't have the link, but if you Google it, that report is actually online as a PDF. You can get it either through the New York Times. I think I got it from the New York Times, but it is a very interesting report. And I think there's a lot of ammunition in there. If you are in sports or interested in sports, the way we have actually had to defend uh, the place of transgender uh, people in sports and, of course, out coaches who are always uh, looked at suspiciously. Well, some of the uh, sexual uh, harassment and abuse and um violations of girls and moving, this moving these coaches around these abusive yeah. coaches around not alerting the new team you're getting an abusive coach who we had to get rid of we're not telling you right. why they just right. covered up for it and the and the women and girls uh suffered uh yes and of course what you know the republican says the big threat to women's sports is transgender it, it's men mm -hmm. <laughs> why don't more women coaches i guess right all right uh, well, let's give them some better news. Uh, let's go to Virginia, uh, where hundreds of students at eight high schools uh, in Prince William County walked out of school to protest Governor Youngkin's anti-trans policies. Before we talk about this further, maybe we should show you a video report, local news report on it. Hundreds of students at McLean High School offer a measure of how far America has traveled on trans rights and how far it has yet to go. Trans rights are human rights. Casey trans Calabria, 17, non-binary, says they rights. only came out while surrounded by the diverse, trans accepting trans community at McLean. We are scared. I am scared. But was bullied, misgendered on their sports team, and suicidal at another less tolerant school. We are real. We are real. These are real kids who are scared out of their minds with this policy. Governor Yunkin calls it parental rights. The new model state policy would out some closeted kids to their parents, cut trans students off from sports teams and bathrooms that match their gender identity, and force teachers to use names and pronouns matching school records. You're not indoctrinating anyone. You're not grooming children. You are telling children that were born queer that you are okay to be queer. Students at nearly 100 schools across the Commonwealth urging the governor to change his mind. I am scared of this man. My friends are scared of this man. How can he stand there and say that he loves his country and the state if he wants to hurt us? The comment period on the State Board of Education website already open. You can see there are thousands and thousands of comments on there already. The vast majority of them opposed to the governor's plans. You have until October 26th to register your feelings. At McLean High School, Bruce Lachan, WUSA 9. So what does the governor think? Well, he says these new guidelines are all about keeping children safe and making sure parents are involved in their kids' school life. If you're against the guidelines, it means you're against having parents involved in students' lives. And I don't think that's where Virginia is. They, Virginia spoke loudly last year in our election that, that parents were really important to have involved in kids' lives. And so I think this is a chance for us to reflect, please read the guidelines, and then uh, work towards making sure that we do include parents in these fundamentally important decisions. Well, I just hope he's going to listen to the people making comments online, and you can make comments online. We, we will put the link in to the Virginia government. You can comment on this. I don't know if it's going to make any difference to these people, but uh, the vast majority will be negative. But as we know from uh, um, Governor DeSantis in Florida and the Don't Say Gay Bill, it's not really about giving the parents more power, is it? No, no. Not uh, really. And, and, you know, students in Arizona walked out, too, about these uh, saying these tra anti-trans bills are killing us uh, there at Hamilton High School in Arizona. 
But better news in California, Governor Gavin Newsom. You know, we, we don't we, we talk about all the anti bills that are passed. He just signed 11 bills pushed by Equality California, the LGBTQ group, including protecting families with trans children who flee these anti-trans states for California, training pharmacists to serve LGBTQ customers better, uh, a youth bill of rights, and requiring community colleges to affirm gender identities of students and staff. 11 bills he signed this week. He's thinking of running for president. Mm -hmm. And well, this is going to be very, very interesting with this legislation because I think it is going to cause brain drains across many of the less progressive states. And uh, they will have brought it on themselves. All right. Now, we got a bad decision in Florida. Um, a federal, well, a bad, but, you know, there's some caveats here. It's a federal judge appointed by Trump. Equality Florida sued over the don't gay, so say gay law, right? This guy says, you don't really have standing to do this. But he said um, that uh, he chastised the school districts that are um, using the law to outside the legal bounds. He, he said uh, DeSantis's rhetoric has had a chilling effect and is causing damage and said that nothing in the law requires school districts to back away from protecting LGBTQ students. Uh, he says... Uh, it should not be used to silence students from talking about having LGBTQ parents, silence LGBTQ teachers from acknowledging their partners, or exclude LGBTQ parents from school events, um, and shouldn't be used to remove signs of support like rainbow flags and things like that. But that's what's being done by the school districts. And, you know, there was that story out of Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma... University, was it? No, no, no. It's a university medical center. They are getting rid of their transgender affirming care for young people yeah. because the, the legislator said, we've got, you'll be losing $40 million of federal funding if you don't. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is the problem. They've really got them over a barrel, and that is not fair. No. All right. Can we go to uh, New York City? Yes. Now, this is going to take a little bit of explaining, and it it's, may sound a little arcane, but, you know, I, I live in a rent-stabilized apartment. Um, if, if I had a, a, a partner, they could succeed in the apartment. They could take over the lease. Uh, this was all decided back in 1986 before we could even get married, uh, maybe 89, right, the famous Brashi decision, uh, because people with AIDS were dying and their partners were getting thrown out and all that kind of stuff. So in this case, a guy is living with someone and he says, you know, I had this familial relationship with them, even though his partner, his sexual partner, lives somewhere else in the city and they were together for 25 years, but they never lived together. So this judge is looking at it and saying, well, non-traditional families, maybe it could be more than one partner. Maybe you can stay. It's not totally decided, but it's a it's kind of a breakthrough at looking at the way we make families and the way we have relationships. So we'll see what happens with that case. Um, can we talk about Taj Patterson? This is the... Uh, yeah, also in New York, also in New York, in, um, uh, in uh, a rapidly, at the time, 2013, a rapidly gentrifying Williamsburg. So this man, Taj Patterson, was apparently walking down the street at four o'clock in the morning when he was... Uh, oh, put the, Put the other picture on, Rich, uh, the this picture is, of what happened to him. That's what happened yeah, to him. That, that is what he looked like after he was set upon by a Hasidic uh, patrol in 2013. Uh, they were called the, um, I think it's called the um, Williamsburg Safety Patrol. And um, these are his injuries. He was beaten by several members of this gang. Uh, and he has basically, he's 31 years of age now, and he's basically been going back and forth trying to get some kind of compensation for the effect this attack has had on his life. Andy, two what do you think about this? Two of the members of the patrol pleaded guilty and were did get sentences. One of the main ones was convicted, and then his conviction was overturned because the higher court said, we think the evidence there was shaky. But these people were using anti-gay slurs against him, obviously beat him, limiting his vision in that eye. He's still not recovered. Uh, from that. Um, so, you know, the, 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 
the Hasidic group did not even show up in court. So the judge said, I award you $4.5 million. And his uh, Taj's lawyer said, now we have to collect on it. This group did not even have insurance. And yet it's a, you know, it's a community patrol from a very politically powerful group. They're getting, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars from the city in funding, even though they don't carry insurance. I run a street fair on our block here. We have to get $2 million worth of insurance for one day. You know, so it's, you know, this is what happens with politics anyway. But it's, um, uh, but Taj, I'm gl- he, he's looking better now. And I hope he gets what, uh, there he is. And I hope he gets uh, his judgment. Right. Collecting the 4.5 million will be very difficult, but I do wish him well as well. Um, maybe we should. Oh, I, I just want to mention that the, the University of Massachusetts football team is hosting on October 8th, this weekend, the anti-LGBTQ Liberty University. And so what did they do? This is the one founded by Jerry Falwell Sr., run by the scurrilous uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. for a long time. They have declared this will be Pride Day uh, for the football team in Massachusetts. And uh, they, they announced it with a video of a football player surrounded by rainbow li- lights and a disco beat. I, I don't follow football at all, but I, I believe this is a, a, a tactic that is growing in popularity, uh, which is to hold these Pride Pride Nights and Pride Days uh, with, with a team such as this. So that, that would be fun. I hope they, they can change uh, some of those folks' minds mid-tackle. So we'll go, go to some other crime stories. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida, a black trans man was shot and killed on September 21st. Samaj Billingsley, 33 years old, shot outside a motel in Argyle Forest. No suspects, described as an entrepreneur whose faith meant everything to him. Uh, The 31st such killing of a trans or or gender nonconforming person in the U.S. this year. Um, And in Lafayette, Louisiana, do you have that? Uh, oh, this is this shocked me terribly, especially with Dharma being uh, screened on uh, Netflix right now. But a Louisiana man, Chase Seneca, 21, has pleaded guilty in kidnapping and vicious assault on an 18-year-old gay man that he met on Grinder in 2020. Uh, he has admitted that he tried to murder this teen. Uh, he planned to kill others until he was caught, uh, government officials said. Right. What he did to this guy was terrible. Stab wounds, strangulation wounds, blunt force trauma to the head, hospitalized for a month. And uh, uh, the, 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 the perpetrator said, I stopped beating him up. He was going to kill him and eat him. He said, I stopped beating him up when, I, when his bones started coming through his flesh. I mean, this is just horrible, horrible. So he has pleaded guilty and, uh, and he could face federal hate crimes charges on top of kidnapping charges. And in Boise, a drag performer named Eric Posey is suing a far-right blogger for releasing a doctored video to falsely make it look like he had exposed himself to children. Uh, Summer Bushnell was the blogger, uh, did the doctoring, and accused Posey of a felony. But police looked into it and said there was, (laughs) they looked at the whole footage of of the thing and said nothing happened here. And Posey said, I lost professional opportunities. And... Oh, Posey is not greedy. I just want ten thousand dollars and attorney's fees. Uh, yeah, something to bear in mind with all of the popularity of videos online and reels in our social media. How this is is often you get these snippets of videos that are being uh, played and shared out of context. And I hope that the laws are going to keep up with the use of this new medium. How about what happened at a Wisconsin prison? You want to talk about that? I think you better grab that one. What right. happened in the Wisconsin prison? Oh, oh yes, I know this one. Well, the trans man guard, yes. So you got a Muslim prisoner who has to be strip searched in the prison, and one of the guards observing the not doing the strip, but one of the observers is a trans man. So the Muslim says, "It's against my religion. This is really a woman. I cannot be looked at naked by a woman." Now, actually, in Islam, the actual tenet of the faith is no one can see you naked except your spouse. But put that aside. Um, Anyway, uh, so at the lower court, he lost, but a three-judge conservative panel, oh, no, his religious liberty is being violated. And uh, 
that that's what they decided. So, you know, they seem to be pushing aside the Bostock decision from the Supreme Court, which says treat mm -hmm. trans people equally in, mm -hmm. in employment and everything. And uh, the court sort of says, oh, no, you know, this guard can go, you know, deal with other things, doesn't have to be there for this. This is where we're headed in this country. That's mm -hmm. going to be religious apartheid in this yes. country if they keep it up. The thing that's very interesting to me about this is that for me, religion is just another form of identification. So you've got just two people in a room who identify in a way that is very uh, much toxic in some ways, you know, uh, but, but that's the issue. It comes down to identification. And um, I like that the, uh, the way that the lawsuit was initially thrown out uh, by the Democrat appointed judge, because he said that West's religious belief about girls' gender didn't outweigh the guard's right to identify and be treated as a man in his workplace. And this is what, what it's going to come down to. I understand you can't set aside your relig religious identification because it informs your daily life. But you also can't um, set aside your gender identification because it informs your daily life and work. So they, they really have a problem here. What, what, do, what does this guy expect to happen in a hospital where you're wearing the, you know, you're wearing the gown and you're, everything is hanging out, you know, and they're looking at your genitals and everything else all day long uh, to check things out. And there are female nurses and there are male nurses and there are trans nurses. I mean, come on, grow up is what I would say. You know, it's just they're not there to be sexual with you. They're there to perform a professional service. Uh, and in this case, to see if you're carrying any drugs around. Anyway, all right, let's 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 remind people um, uh, about our friend Urvashi Vad. There's going to be a memorial service for Urvashi, uh, who died uh, earlier this uh, year. Um, it's now set for Thursday, November 3rd at 5 p.m. at Bene Jeshrun, which is at 257 West 88th Street on November the 3rd. Uh, we will include a link if you wish to register for it. All guests must be vaccinated. There is also a link on the invitation to watch a live stream of the event at that time. So you could watch this from anywhere in the country. Urvashi Vad, one of our great leaders, former head of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and et cetera. That, that will be live streamed on YouTube direct from the temple. So that would be a wonderful, wonderful uh, way of seeing what this woman did for our community. You know, she was only like 62 or three uh, cancer, but uh, fought to the end. Okay, uh, some other uh, international news. Yes. Um, you know, I just you, wanna, what, what do we got left for the international? Well, I just want to bring this up. The New York Times did a big profile of the Zambian president, uh, Hich, uh, Hichi Lema and said he wanted to get rid of all the colonial era rule uh, laws. But they never mentioned that he just that week, he came out, you know, oh, but not the anti-gay ones. We're keeping those. We're a Christian country. You know, we're not throwing off the, you know, uh, the, the church on that one. So uh, his love does not extend to the Zambians. And then there's a uh, uh, cutter um, where the World Cup starts next month. They're in trouble. Uh, they, they have a U.N. ambassador who is in trouble over tweets uh, uh, calling Jews our enemies, calling for God's curse on gay men. So she deletes her account when this happens because she's up for one of the top human rights posts in the U.N. And this stopped it. Thank goodness uh, they, they stopped it. Uh, there's, a, there's an NGO, non-governmental organization, called UN Watch, which spotted her bigotry, scuttled her nomination. It went instead to Patricia Herman of the Bahamas. Um, this, this UN, this Cutter woman said, defending human rights has nothing to do with gay rights. Now, this woman from the Bahamas who's taking over, uh, you know, same-sex relations are legal there, but no partnership recognition. Uh, but they did support the UN Declaration on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity in 2012. All right. And oh, also breaking news. One of the winners of the Nobel Prize for medicine, uh, Svante Pabo, 67 years old, uh, is bisexual, openly bisexual, has written about it. He helped found the study of paleogenetics about uh, they, did, they did the Neanderthal genome from 500,000 wow. years ago. It's relevant because if you've got some Neanderthal DNA, 
you're more likely to suffer from COVID. Oh, sorry. Just really, me. I do. I apparently do have more Neanderthal uh, sorry, DNA. Sorry, I don't know what DNA I have. Sorry. Well, I did my I did my twenty three and me. I have more Neanderthal than the average person. But touch wood, thus far, no COVID. So that's I'm I'm happy. I hope it has advantages as well, and because uh, they you know. But this guy's father won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1982. All right. Um, health and AIDS news. Hey, uh, did you? Sorry to read about Christine Quinn. Chris uh, is was our yeah. former New York City Council speaker, and uh, uh, she put out an article in Vanity Fair about actually her- Vogue magazine. Vogue magazine. It was oh, a first-person piece. Yes. yes. Why did I say Vanity Fair? Because it's a V and it's fashion and style, but it was a lovely, I, I do think people should read this because it was a very nice, it's short, it's very personal, it's uh, something she wrote herself. Describing about her battle about, with colon cancer. Yeah, colorectal cancer, and also about that she was diagnosed with it at age 56, which is the same year her mother died from cancer. And and what this means, really, uh for us as we as we age as women especially as, as really any gender i think but uh, she basically said that the loneliness and and the emotional space that she was put in during um her treatment was something she hadn't expected and that it was really important to articulate that to reach out and to and to make it a visible thing for other people to you know to understand and to um not feel so alone so i, I did applaud that piece yeah she runs a, a group she runs a group for uh, homeless women now and we certainly send her our, our best wishes uh, we will link to her story in vogue <laughs> uh and so you can read it if you get our email and if you want to get our email go to gayusatv.org and while you're stopping by on our website, if you want to support us and help us get through another year, uh, that would be appreciated as well. Let's talk about monkeypox. OK, latest news. Uh, cases way down. CDC says elimination is unlikely, at least for the next few years. Um, the domestic decline, though, does mark a turning a corner. By the way, 97 percent of the cases are men. Um, uh, and a uh, vast majority of those are men who have sex with men. But then, now the new guidance, now, first of all, they, they also came out with data on how the vaccines are working. They're working very well. You've got like a, a 14 times more likely to get MPV, to get the virus, if you don't get the vaccine. Get the vaccine if you are at risk. I haven't gotten the vaccine because I'm not, you know, putting myself at risk these days. Um, you know, I thought about it in the beginning because I thought it was going to be more easily transmissible. But, you know, it's mainly, but they are opening it up. It used to be you have to have been like really screwing around for the last 14 days to get the vaccine. Now it's like, if you might do those things in the next six months, you can get the vaccine. So get the vaccine. They're much more available now. All right. And, it, and the, the, the data on it is good. Monkeypox. Don't get it. You don't want it. No. All right. Uh, a footnote on Sasheen Littlefeather. Do you remember her? She's the one. I do. Up. She's the one who got I up. I do. Got what up. a beautiful woman. What a beautiful woman. And it was such a scandal back in the day when you were watching the Oscar ceremony uh, to, to see this, this un- for us then, a very unusual looking person to get up on this, uh, on this show busy platform. A Native but, American yeah. who was sent by Marlon Brando to refuse his Oscar <laughs> and to talk about the plight of Native Americans. And she was booed. And of course, the Academy tried to make it up to her, um, I think last year. But anyway, the, the, the footnote on her, she just died at the age of 75, was that during the early years of the AIDS pandemic, she worked at a Bay Area hospice for PWAs, founded by Mother Teresa, blending her native culture and her Catholic faith. Quite a story. Um, I, I just got goosebumps because she she said she was able to uh, blend all the aspects of herself and reconnect with the Catholic faith of her childhood. Uh, she did lead. Uh, she led a San Francisco prayer circle named for Kateri Tikakawitha, a 17th century Algonquin and Mohawk woman who was canonized by Pope ben- Benedict the 16th. And I just think what a perfect example of coexistence because that group blended traditions, including incorporating buffalo dances into the Catholic Mass. And Kateri Tikakawitha is a saint, and she's on the she's on the doors of St. Patrick's Cathedral. It, and I once. 
I once hung a protest sign on her praying hands, a petition to the cardinal. Kateri Teka with a lily of the Mohawks. All right. I, I love it. But she, but she said, this is how I saved my life, by blending the two together. Uh, she told The Guardian in 2021, the acceptance of my dominant culture's ways and my Indian ways together, living peacefully side by side. Now, Marin, we have 13 minutes left. Oh, let's want, go. Should we run our HIV is not a crime video? Would you yes. like to just tell us what is in it? Well, this is uh, from the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, hosted by Andre De Shields, and he explains where we are 40 years into the pandemic in terms of reforming laws that criminalize many people with HIV. Shall we run it? We can run it because we've only got entertainment le left to talk about, don't we? So. Yeah. Let's go. This is a redemption story about a man who had to lose everything before he could find himself. To everyone who knew him, Andre Lepard was a minister and a professional counselor who spent his days serving God and his community. He was also a gay man living with HIV. Locked in a fierce struggle with his sexuality, Andre's faith was woven into his DNA. Andre dated women on and off, but after years of running from his gay life, he decided to date men exclusively. But the guilt was always there. It fueled his anxiety and depression. His HIV diagnosis in 2015 only made it worse. In 2016, the CDC recognized that people with an undetectable viral load for six months cannot pass HIV on through sex, even when condoms aren't used. Like millions of others, Andre's HIV could no longer be detected or spread. Modern antiretroviral therapy transformed HIV into a manageable chronic condition. In December of 2016, Andre met a man online, we'll call him Vic. They hit it off immediately, and for the first time in years, Andre was comfortable in his own skin. There was just one tiny elephant in the room, Andre's HIV status. This was the watershed moment in Andre's life. Two roads diverged, but unlike Frost's protagonist, Andre froze up. He did not disclose his HIV status to Vic. He wanted to, he knew he should, but even within the gay community, HIV stigma and discrimination are rampant. Many at-risk people aren't aware that successful treatment prevents transmission. Andre witnessed that discrimination firsthand. Months into their relationship. Well, I'm sorry, that's the video that follows on YouTube after the one we wanted to run with Andre DeShields. Uh, which, but I will link to that in our email. Uh, we, we apologize for the error. That's so funny because I actually really enjoyed that. <laughs> well, we can link to that one too then, Marin. <laughs> Uh, but uh, let's let's uh, let's move on now to entertainment news. Yes. Okay. Uh, Anne wants to bring to our attention a uh, a teen drama called High School. Do you know about this one? I actually don't. Well, uh, Tega and Sarah Quinn. Uh, oh yes. Yes, Real life. Tegan, Tegan, yes, Tegan and Sarah, they're, uh, they're, Sarah. The, ones who are, they're the rock pop, um, they've been going for a long time, and, and uh, this, is their, this is their deal, right? Yeah, they're real life, uh, and it has lesbian themes. It bows October 14th on something called Amazon Freevee, a free mm -hmm. streaming service which carries ads. It's set in the 90s grunge and rave culture, and it stars uh, real life twins Rayleigh and Cezin. Uh, S E A Z Y N N, uh, Grill, Grill, oh, Gilliland in their debuts uh, as twins trying to, uh, they're trying to establish their own identities. You know, they're twins, but they don't share everything. It's interesting about twins because, you know, sexual orientation does correlate quite a bit, but not entirely with identical twins. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we can assume that this show is loosely based on possibly Tegan and Sarah's own yeah. experiences. We can. All right. So I did see the movie Bros, uh, the Billy Eichner movie, which uh, opened this week. Um, and it's in theaters. It's in 3000 theaters. Uh, there's the poster, which was, you know, apparently they originally wanted to do a poster with them in tuxedos getting married. But that has nothing to do with the story. This is like uh, one of the funniest and certainly the gayest film I've almost ever seen, unapologetically LGBTQ. It stars, put their pictures up, Billy Eichner there on the right uh, with Luke McFarlane uh, about how they 
meet cute. It's a gay rom-com, uh, but it deals with, you know, gay sex explicitly. Well, not, you know, uh, totally, totally, but it's, you know, it's out there. Gay love, relationship issues, getting along with each other in our LGBTQI com community. Um, Billy plays the head of a new LGBTQ national museum uh, that is getting started, which seems to become a, be, be a big thing these days. And uh, so I enjoyed it. Michael Musto gave it a nice review, said it's full of topical humor, sweetness, and edginess with an all queer cast, um, funny and seething with righteous activism. It's got a 91% rating on like, you know, uh, Rotten Tomatoes. It's, it's, so it's doing very well. But it's it, the box office hasn't been that great. Are you waiting till it comes on television? Is that what you're waiting for? I am because I watch the rom-com on my laptop now. I wouldn't go to the cinema uh, and pay the money and, and expose myself to, you know, viruses just to see a rom-com. And I know a lot of gay people, including I, you know, are upset about the box office takings. This is in flop territory now, commercially. But I think it's not about uh, it being gay at all. I think it's literally about film genre and that we're still coming out of a pandemic and people are going to be choosy about what they see in the cinema. So, um, the, the horror movie Smile opened in the same weekend and that's a hit, but a horror movie is something to see on the big screen wow. with surround sound and things coming at you out of the dark. So for me, that's my take on this. Our viewers will know, I'm a pretty harsh critic, um, but I laughed a lot out loud, you know, in the dark there in the theater at this, and I was quite moved by it in the end. And it's really intense in terms of the way it deals with our issues. It deals with them intelligently, and uh, but with a great deal of humor. So I, I'm going to recommend it whenever you get to see it, whether in theaters or um, when it eventually comes to cable. Some people said it should have been launched at the same time as cable. That's the new way of doing these things. The only thing people go to the theaters anymore to see are shoot 'em ups, you know. Uh, so anyway, and there's another gay rom com coming on December second. It's called Spoiler Alert. They, there, there's Jim Parsons there uh, on the right, uh, meeting cute with Ben Aldridge. Uh, it's based on Michael Osiello's memoir, Spoiler Alert: The Hero Dies, about life with his late husband Kit Cowan, who was diagnosed with terminal. Uh, neurodocrine cancer in 2014. Uh, but it also is sort of partly a comedy, partly a, obviously a drama, um, very famous stars, you know, so, but you're saying <laughs> we may, may have to wait to see that at home as well. Maybe. Uh, what about something that we did watch on streaming, if we had the stomach for it? Uh, Netflix, uh, the, the series about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer through the eyes of Ryan Murphy. Have you had the guts to watch it yet, Andy? I have not. Uh, I, it, it doesn't appeal to me, but, I, you know, uh, how are the reviews? Um, this is starring, uh, what's his name? Evan Peters, a uh, playing yes. Dahmer who murdered 17 men and boys, most of whom were people of color. The families of the victims are very upset about the exploitation of this thing. It did go to uh, number one last week on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, but gay people said, you're putting this in the LGBTQ category? Get it off there. And Netflix responded and just put it in true crime. It's not going to be on your LGBTQ list. This is Jeffrey Dahmer, a monster. But... You know, how many times? I mean, this is another Ryan Murphy thing. He's sort of obsessed with these gay killers. Remember Andrew Cunanan uh, killing? Yeah, yeah listen, well. I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan. So, I mean, I, I, right. do, I do feel there's a, there's a, you know, it's an interesting discussion. But I, I do happen to agree this doesn't belong in the LGBTQ section, even though Dharma was obviously uh, gay. I, I do feel that the story is so much uh, more than that. And, and anyway, it's out for up for debate whether or not LGBTQ is a genre of anything. So oh, in terms of entertainment. So. But we do love Amy Schneider. We do love her and we do love her and applaud her happy ending with Genevieve Davis. They announced that they, they were married in May and they've shared a few of their lovely photos on Instagram. And I think we'll always be grateful for uh, Amy for sharing her, her life on Jeopardy and on her Twitter account that was often uh, devoted to her progress on Jeopardy. It's lovely, positive uh, imagery for us. 
And we'll get to see Amy when she comes back for the Tournament of Champions. She's one of the, uh, she's the second, she's got the second longest winning streak of anybody in the history of the game. She was amazing. And she's planning a more traditional ceremony next summer. She said that uh, Davis proposed to her uh, and then Schneider got down and proposed back to her. So that's how <laughs> they did it, keeping things equal. Um, the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art in Soho here in Manhattan is having a new exhibit right through January 8th, Incendia, featuring what they call queer, rare artists from Latin America or of Latin American descent around the world. So go to lesliloman.org for information, and we will link to that in our email, which you can sign up for by going to gayusatv.org. What about the wonderful Ann Northrup has a, a wonderful event uh, on? Would you like to talk about that? Marching Mad, the 1987 March on Washington and well, its impact on our nation. Well, uh, you know, as we've said, uh, the, the American Museum of LGBTQ History is getting started here in New York. It hasn't opened yet, but they're having an online online event Tuesday, October 11th, National Coming Out Day at 6.30 p.m. online that you can sign up for a panel on this 1987 March in Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. That was the second uh, uh, national march that we had. That's the one where the quilt was laid out uh, there. Uh, this is like at the uh, end of the Reagan administration, and then we got the Bush administration. Um, but anyway, Anne is moderating, and it's going to include organizers, uh, Joyce Hunter, Steve All, two of my comrades from the old days, and Letty Gomez. If you register at AmericanLGBTQMuseum.org, you can also stream a documentary about the 1987 march, and you can view that anytime in October. So sign up for that. Okay, um, and then we should remind you that the new fest, uh, the LGBTQ Film Festival, is starting October 13th in New York, goes through the 25th. 130, 130 LGBTQ films. What are you looking forward to there? Uh, I mean, this is too much. New Fest has some of the best, uh, they always have some of the best programming and I'm a big fan of, of their work. But, th but this one, I'm the centerpiece documentary, which is called Nellie and Nadine, which is about two women who, who met at the Revensbrook concentration camp um, and fell in love. I mean, it's based on a true story and it features the music of uh, Madame Butterfly, I mean, what's not to like? I'm just getting goosebumps talking about it. It has incredible reviews online. So they saved the each I'm other's lives, basically, right? Pretty, With their love. Much. And it's narrated by the granddaughter who's going through the box of letters and finds out about these letters to this woman. And she's drawn to find out who, 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 who was this woman? Were they just friends? What, what was this in her, between her grandmother? Uh, so I'm so excited by stories like that. Because you just told like, me. Yeah, you think you know our history and there's always something new. So it's exciting. LGBTQ History Month. It's a great film to watch, I think. And that's why our right wing opponents are trying to suppress our history because they don't want to they don't want to tell you how badly we were treated in the old days and they want to treat us bad now. So it's a troubled time, but it's great to be with you, Marin, here. And we're down to our last 10 seconds. So I'm just going to say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye bye. Marin.